Our next speaker is August Cole. August is an acclaimed author and futurist who focuses on national security. He's a senior fellow at the Art of the Future Project at the Atlantic Council and works on creative foresight at Spark Cognition, an artificial intelligence company. I know many of you attending today are fans of his book, Ghost Fleet, that August co-authored with P.W. Singer. And look for August's new book soon, Burn In, a novel of the real robot revolution. August? All right, you guys can hear me, I assume, uh, and you'll tell me if you can't. I'm going to talk for about 30 minutes, uh, 20 minutes uh, will be me just uh, doing a quick kind of lecture, and then we can get into some Q&A, hopefully. So this is indeed a very difficult moment on many levels, especially when you're trying to forecast a future that feels like is really difficult to even keep up with the present. Um, one of the things that keeps coming back to me in the context of AI and the, the conference today is that many of the, the trends that, that I've been exploring in the last couple of years seem like they are going to be accelerated by what is arguably a biological event. But then again, isn't technology itself somewhat of a biological construct too, right? So we're, we're on this path for a summer of incredible economic and social disruption that is, you know, of course, not uh, attributed to, to AI. But again, a lot of those trend lines and vulnerabilities and fault lines that you're going to see uh, exposed um, will be really important to keep in a greater context as we talk about discrete technologies and capabilities around the next generation of machine learning and other systems. I'm going to cover essentially three things. You know, one is how this FICINT concept that I, I like to talk about, which is, you know, fiction plus intelligence. The idea that, you know, you can mine creative content, you can create it with the idea of doing something that is in effect collectible, uh, it is analyzable, it's actionable. And what I, what I think is important about this construct, you know, in the sense that we are thinking about the way that uh, an acronym or, or similar uh, kind of official looking label gives the, gives the concept is that it also allows people to take, take this, this premise seriously. You know, we are certainly at a point where, whether it's Mad Scientist uh, Initiative, like we just heard, the Marine Corps efforts uh, from Ender's Galley at Marine Corps University, where they're producing graphic novels, to Simsec in the Navy, and the short story competitions, which have been serially uh, successful. You're seeing a real appetite for alternative ways to analyze and really think, think thoughtfully about the, the future, to try to understand not just you know, trend lines and concepts and ideas, but what are we really going to be seeing uh, from, a, from a first person and human point of view. So, so to that to that end, I'll I'll talk a little bit about kind of how to use Ficant in this moment. And the second is a is a kind of riff on that, which is you know what makes a good story and how to how to create your own work, uh, especially at a time like this when we are trying to make sense of of what we see around us. You know the Mark Twain quote that I'll butcher it, but it's something to the effect of you know I never know what I think about something until I write it down. I think is an actually really apt way to describe foresight, um, especially when you're talk, doing uh, talking or doing creative writing. And the last uh, thing I'll, I'll discuss is uh, I, what I think is worth reading, watching, and, and playing right now. Uh, we, we are all very busy and juggling myriad things, but I think if we can create some space to, uh, to play video games for work, to carve out some just head-clearing activity, there's a lot of yield and benefit to that. So the, the, the kind of larger kind of premise here about, you know, thicket in the pandemic era that we're in you know, one of the, the asks, this is true with Ghost Fleet, it's true with Burn-In, it's really thinking the unthinkable. And when you're in the middle of something that is in itself uh, almost an unthinkable experience, it's really difficult to find that like intellectual and also emotional distance from the act and activity that's, that's going on around us. Yet within that, I think it's also incumbent to remember the tenets and the basics of trying to do good foresight with fiction. You know, these different elements of Thickent itself, which can be seen as an acronym, Things like foresight, which is of course self-described, the idea of uh, individuals being a critical perspective from which you're trying to understand a future environment. You know, the, the perspective that writers like Madeline Ashby, uh, I think have done so well in her work, like Company Town, a novel, um, in giving voice to people who aren't often heard uh, or overlooked. And I think in the midst of what we're experiencing right now, that's a critical way to start to think through the fullest and most complete and authentic picture of not just the world we're in, of course, but what's coming next. Um, because the decisions we make today will have a long tail. Uh, there are structural changes that will be affected by very tactical and political decisions right now that will, of course, impact you know everything from social and economic resiliency to you know, America's 
larger trust in science and technology. I'd say both of those are, are, are really up in the air at this point. This collaborative aspect too, if you wanna use again, thickend as an acronym, the C, I think is is also really critical because you know no book gets written you know by just an author sitting in a in a creekside cabin, uh, as nice as that might be for maybe an afternoon. It really wouldn't really get you to to the to, to the market so to speak. You know these are collaborative works, and I'm lucky to work enough to work uh, with a writer uh, you know who I, I trust and and get along with great in, in our novels. Um, and I think that can be true for the collaborative aspects in, in short story writing or even longer fiction projects for, for yourselves as well. And the reason is that we all have our own blind spots and being able to you know, try to encompass a really, again, authentic, credible, actionable picture of a future environment is a lot to try to take on just yourself. You can be a great researcher, you can be a heck of an empath, but you're still gonna miss things. And being able to have a team, whether it's an editor, whether it is an actual collaborator, whether it's a muse, of some kind or giving yourself the space to do that kind of deep reflection, um, you're gonna help check those blind spots. And so in my case, I found, for example, that you know, being able to show something to Pete that we've worked on and get fresh eyes on it, that might take me literally a month to figure out the problem uh, in, in, a, in a concept, in a, in a framing of a technology, and someone else can look at it in 30 seconds and say, you know what, I think we need more X or Y. That's excellent. And I think something that is really important to, to encourage in, in this moment too, when we're physically isolated from one another, um, and yet we're also, I think, acutely aware of how important and valuable it is to, to collaborate. Um, you know, the, the inspirational aspect, the, the second I in Ficant is, of course, really, really important now too, because this is uh, a difficult time at a personal level, at a, at a you know, community and tribal level, even among the, the deaf tribe. I, I think that, you know, we are always, when we're writing about really dark and pessimistic futures, trying to not write them as a form of indulgence, or uh, which I think is, is, is misleading. I mean, yeah, it can be kind of fun, but the larger sense of mission that goes with creating useful fiction is to help find a way to avoid that future or a way out of it. And we are certainly in the midst of something that we are trying to find our way out of. Um, but those, those same imperatives are going to be coming back to us, uh, especially in the national security community, in different forms, but many of the, the patterns that we can develop, the habits, the community, the tribes will be a way to do that. And so that collective aspect of um, whether it's the shareability of a story or the collaborative aspect of working together is, is crucial in trying to inspire people to not be stuck in the kinds of ruts that lead to doing the same thing again and again and hoping for a different solution. You know, the N is, uh, is about nuance, right? Like, you know, fiction really helps explore the gray area. And I think thematically, even when we're trying to think about something that seems binary or black and white, like great power conflict, you know, two big countries smashing into each other. That is arguably perhaps more of a highly nuanced competition uh, than, than we would otherwise uh, like to assume. You can't buy your way out of those sorts of contests. You can't necessarily fight your way out of those contests. And so the more we can start to understand that and the role that technologies like AI play in those tensions, in those uh, engagements, you know, whether they're peaceful or whether they're, they're militarized, it's gonna be really important in, in trying to use this sort of aspirational fiction to, to figure out ways to, to, to get at that. And the last, of course, T is just technology, which is, it seems self-explanatory, but when you bundle all these ideas together, you're really trying to see technology from the human perspective from the idea that you know, we are playing with constructs that are you know, created by us for now. Machines obviously are going to play a greater role in creating uh, many, much of the software I think that will be you know, world shaping maybe in the 2030s. But while we still have time to uh, feel like we have a destiny in, in you know, articulating this kind of software driven future, I think this is really imperative on us to, to think about what that's like from a human perspective. It's too easy to get into mindsets that try to ascribe technology as a solution to all kinds of problems that are fundamentally human in the, in the, you know, in the, at their core. Uh, there was a really great question uh, that was asked in a prior session about being too enamored with technology. And I think that is certainly a risk, especially if we tr start to see many of the breakthroughs that are going on right now, whether it's you know, pushing AI further to the edge, you know, the, the closer we put machine learning on a chip uh, down to the soldier level, down to the individual level, we're gonna have even more transformative civilian world uh, breakthroughs, let alone you know, military and, and, and kind of strategic competition. 
uh, breakthroughs. And yet at the same time, we can't forget these really important human uh, elements. And, and within that, you know, there are of course, novel threats. Uh, you know, pandemics are not a new one. Um, and for better or for worse, we still find it very difficult to prepare for. Uh, you know, this is, I think, a causal uh, aspect of really figuring out what it means to be strategically prepared as a nation for the next century. And this is a test we're failing right now. And it's likely that we'll fail it uh, if we don't change some of our, our kind of uh, very traditional and bureaucratic and politically minded responses to you know existential or, or near existential threats you know ai fits very much into that basket and i think it's the sort of uh, moment we're at when we see the direct application of a technology that if it's done really well will be arguably quite invisible um, much in the same way that this idea that a virus can be transformative to an entire society uh, in a negative sense and it has its own sort of invisibility and yet we're trying to also fight it in a world that is bounded by the same rules of, of science and, and that we're that we're you know framing us in the in the kind of human construct that goes with being able to overcome the environment that we're in you know ai is part of that solution uh when it comes to figuring out you know the very simple problems that we start to need to consider post covid around how do we provide for people how do we keep them safe the, the next aspect of the of the kind of you know framework i think in the in the sense of how I'm thinking about from like a writer's perspective of, of this moment we're in. And, and it's really difficult in part because I feel like there are these hour to hour, often moment to moment evolutions in my own uh, emotional you know, comfort with a given dynamic or paradigm, and then something will change. And I think that's something we're gonna have, we're gonna have to get used to that uh, more and more. We're in a compressed version of that right now because um, we're hyper attentive and hyper aware. But at the same time, I think you're going to start to see that um, accelerated dynamism be something that is going to be really difficult from a foresight perspective to keep up with. And so the question is, well, how do you do that? I think you need to focus on kind of the big, the big you know, trend lines, right? You know, the importance of the the you know hero, the importance of the villain. Uh, the scene of the Teddy Roosevelt's captain walking off the ship and being cheered by his crew was, was such a like literary moment. Um, but it's also an indication too that you know we are at this point where there is a mismatch or imbalance between what we expect uh, of leaders in, a, in an almost non-technological sense uh, when we don't have actually a response and we are left to our own human devices. And that, to me, of course, as someone who's trying to make sense of this through narrative, is incredibly interesting. Um, you know, I came away from thinking like you you could imagine a future where a captain is walking off a ship and there is no crew, uh, and perhaps there is no cheering. Uh, because we're at a paradigm in the 2030s or 2040s where we've decided that the liabilities of, of human crew, you know, naval warships are exceed the, the operational value. But yet you still won't be able to automate your way out of leadership. And, and I think those sorts of tenets, if you start to go down those paths, are really important to, uh, to always keep in mind. You know, the, the larger trend line, too, about the fiscal burden of this crisis, you know, from a FICANT point of view, means starting to think through not just how we might see everyday automation, you know, big companies investing today in short-term fixes like hiring temporary labor to do logistics and uh, fulfillment, but that's also going to see, I'm fairly certain, an accelerated ramp up in the automation of, you know, our everyday economy. Um, the checkout clerks, you know, distribution services, whether they're drones that drop off packages in your backyard, you know, that remains to be seen, but the, the, uh, the corporate imperative to usher in some of this uh, ML driven automation is, is only increasing by the week. And even if the economic uh, imperative is, is, is more acute because there's not gonna be a lot to invest right now, that trend line is certainly going to speed up. Um, that's gonna be very much about like market capture for companies that do that. And that's gonna start to profoundly you know, change society. So whether you know, we see the jobs that are being lost now come back 24 months from now, some of them may be uh, on their way you know, back into the workforce in the 2021, 2022 window. But at the same time, I think you're gonna see equally an acceleration of the introduction of robotic systems and, and, and software driven um, solutions for a lot of the, the non-physical touch uh, you know, industries out there. Even at the high end, like labor uh, may see an automated or dark warehouse, a law firm might see much more algorithmic focus on, on its activities like discovery, for example. And, and I think, you know, the acknowledgement that like we're at this point, and this is the, some of the work with, with Pete and I on burn-in, we've been thinking through like the essence of being 
a human in this world in America, particularly where we bought into a system that that rewards a certain kind of economic participation in a sense uh, that gives us a kind of value, and and that of course is inter intricately you know linked to the discrete technological advances in these very AI and, and machine learning systems, and the same forces that will be rewriting the rules of commerce of democracy. Uh, are obviously not just going to affect the operational environment, but the construct of Western militaries themselves. I was uh, fortunate enough to do a recent project for uh, NATO Allied Command Transformation that the story hopefully will go up soon, but I was really uh, struck when I started to think through the future of the standing army. And I've been increasingly exploring this question of, as we begin to look at the long-term costs around sustaining uh, large standing armies, that the appeal of automating and having almost like a uh, just in case of fire break glass model of automated systems in many of the Western European nations may in fact become more important, particularly as we go into uh, a period of intense economic uh, pressure. You know, COVID is accelerating it, but it was coming anyway with, uh, with you know, job replacement from automation and AI. So that is going to have fundamental impact on force structure, I would, I would, I would argue. Um, we don't know how much yet, of course, because this is still, you know, 15 to 10 years off. But if you look at the way we buy, look at the way we equip, uh, those sorts of changes will start to be apparent sooner than we think because of the way that we develop technology in, in the defense sector. You know, the the other really important aspect of this is, of course, so let's say you want to explore this question of the end of the standing army. Uh, let's say you want to try to understand what the operational environment in the Black Sea region looks like in the post-COVID or in the COVID era in 2021. You know, I think one of the, the most important things to do is when you're creating this sort of useful fiction or fiction is to start by thinking about who is your reader. And, you know, some of this is my old journalistic mindset, but I do think it's really important to, to, to know kind of who you think might be reading. And of course, we can't obviously control and we want as many people to read as possible, but I find it helpful to start with an idea of like, who's my ideal reader? Who am I trying to reach? And, and there's another aspect too, and this is something I think that's familiar to people who write white papers, but like, what's the ask? You know, if someone reads my short story, what do I want them to do? How do I want them to think differently? Do I want them to be more empathetic? Do I want them to see a threat in a new way? Do I want them to, uh, you know, reconsider their own relevance um, in a way that's accessible and isn't going to make them reject something like that? And so I think, you know, being able to really articulate that, write it down or discuss it for that matter is really, really important in, in creating something that in, in the end is, is effective. Um, you know, the other aspect that we're, that we're, you know, experiencing right now, of course, is an overload of information in this moment of trying to understand the human experience of, of being in this pandemic, you know, experience. And, and I think reading widely, uh, taking a break from it as well, um, is, is really helpful in terms of giving your, your kind of cognitive processes some time to, to you know, reflect and, and kind of digest a little bit what you're experiencing, because you're going to mind that, you know, and the, the adage that a writer should stick to what they know, I don't think is quite right. Um, my life uh, is not that exciting, and I think my work would be pretty boring uh, if I did that. However, I do think that we can often really try to tap into how we feel or what we're, what we're really kind of thinking or not thinking, as the case may be, about a certain uh, idea or trend or concept. And so that's part of the, the space that, that reading widely can help, can help create. And, and at the same time, you know, you're, you're also trying to, to weigh this idea that, you know, we're, we're writing science fiction sometimes and trying to describe a world transformed by by technology again particularly AI or you know machine learning driven automation and and the reality is a lot of really really powerful technological change is somewhat invisible uh, and and that can be really really challenging to to kind of create you know the the sense driven um, you know frame of reference for a reader and so I think the way to do that is to remember that very human uh, experience within those worlds and that you can somewhat liberate yourself from trying to didactically, describe a world transformed by technology and simply just set people loose in that in that environment. Um, and that is often a more authentic way to, to get at that to get at that world. You know, the, uh, the last thing I'll, I'll kind of tuck into here before we switch to uh, the Q&A is that, you know, we're in the middle of a system shock. Um, this one feels pretty quick, but there are some slow moving parts to it too. And, you know, because we know that technology exists within the larger context of societies, how this shock travels through America, how it travels through the West, how it travels through China, et cetera, is going to be felt for, for some time. And so it's important to not neglect those non, you know, natural perspectives that we might gravitate towards or try to think about the voices that we're not listening to. 
to understand perhaps the maybe a glimmer of uh, a more possible future than the one we're comfortable acknowledging. And, and I think that's really, really vital because it's an attitudinal uh, perspective. You're not looking for validation when you're, you're picking up uh, something to read or watch or play. Um, you know, some of the, the video games lately that I found pretty interesting was a new Modern Warfare game, uh, which is probably especially popular now because they've kind of turned it into a Fortnite like, you know, Battle Royale. But in the story version of that game, which they clearly invested some money in, there, there's a whole, you know, I don't know, 20 minutes, half an hour that's dedicated to flying, um, you know, essentially insurgent made homemade drones. Uh, and, and that's something that's novel in the sense for video games that are really trying to portray off in technology in a very like attractive and, uh, and kind of showy way to kind of really dedicate a lot of effort to um, exploring one of the kind of most important, I think, technological breakthroughs, which is the you know, democratization of you know, destructive air power um, from off the shelf tech. And so that's, that's an interesting aspect of that game, which contrasts, I think, to another game called Ghost Recon Breakpoint, which is very like on the nose about the evil of, of AI battle systems gone amok. And uh, you know has a lot of game design that's pretty interesting in the portrayal of swarms and, and big Leviathan tanks and such. But fundamentally, to me, is not as interesting about what it has to say about technology as, as the modern warfare game. You know, when it comes to reading, uh, there's a ton of really good pandemic fiction out there. Uh, I've been trying to get through Salvation City by Sigrid Nunez for like three months, uh, which is a very difficult. Yeah, just, it's hard for me to read about plagues in the middle of a plague. But that's a story about kind of what comes after um, in the middle of the, the kind of heartland of America. Uh, I'd also recommend like Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel, which is again, very much about post-plague life. Uh, the Mandibles, uh, which is a, really about system collapse. It's not plague story, but nonetheless kind of makes you rethink whether America has a durable society or not. And then there's a really interesting book by Lawrence Wright who wrote um, The Looming Tower. He wrote, um, a book that is coming out called The End of October. Uh, it's out in the next month or two, depending if they keep to that schedule. And it's envisioned as a prequel to Cormac McCarthy's The Road, which is one of the darkest, most difficult books I've, I've, I've read, uh, especially if you have children, uh, because it's really kind of meditation on, on parenting and dying. Um, but that book by Lawrence Wright potentially could be really good. Uh, he was also, if you remember the movie The Siege with Bruce Wallace and Denzel Washington, he wrote that uh, pre 9-11 in, in a very kind of powerful way. But there's two books I was going to show you because um, I have them here and I'm a big fan. This is Matt Gallagher's Empire City, which is like if you had the Watchmen uh, do a treatise on Civ Mill relations. Uh, I highly recommend reading it. It comes out next month. Um, Matt's a, an Army veteran who has written some other excellent fiction, both short and long. But this is, I think, a really interesting bit of thicket in the sense that you know we are seeing some some stress Civ Mill systems right now, and this is another way of kind of considering the power. The political power of an alternative America's uh, of military in, a, in kind of a long war context. And the other one is fascinating, and this book scared the heck out of me. This is a, a comic book called Extinct, Extinction Parade by Max Brooks. Um, it's terrifying and it's gory, um, and it's some of Max's, I think, best work. Uh, it is essentially asking the question if you, it's about food security, right? If you're a vampire and there's a zombie outbreak, what are you going to eat? So if you ever want to try to get into that, that scarcity mindset uh, and really go outside your comfort zone uh, to do so, Extinction Parade, it's, uh, I think, a two-book or three-book series um, is excellent for doing that. I'm just warning you, it's grisly, uh, but it's quite a shock to, to consider something. It's a fundamental question that, of course, we're, you know, lightly considering now um, that doesn't feel as abstract. So I'm going to uh, stop fire hosing here and uh, turn over to Q&A and, and I'd love to kind of take some questions. Tim asks, uh, he says, thanks, August, for helping emphasize the importance of fiction as a medium of professional thinking and development. To my frustration, fiction reading in the military is still generally viewed more as a hobby or indulgence rather than a professional requirement. Adam, we've got uh, Tim's open. He'll be able to, to talk through oh, his yeah. uh, question. Sorry. Go and then, uh, then we'll do C. Coley. Uh, he'll, he'll want you to read that one out for him. Okay, go for it, Tim. Awesome. Hey, thanks, August. I really appreciate the time. Um, as, uh, as they were kind of saying, uh, in my opinion, fiction is absolutely a big medium um, for pro professional thinking and development. Uh, but to my frustration in, uh, in the Air Force, and I think the DOD writ large, uh, fiction has been still generally viewed more as a hobby or indulgence rather than a professional requirement. Uh, to help kind of counter this point, which you've done a lot already, uh, and to help me indulge a little bit, can you tell us what your favorite book is uh, and what you're reading now? I know you've already mentioned a few. Thanks. 
Oh yeah, that's great. I mean, it, it is a it is a challenge, right? You know, to to kind of fight for that credibility. And and I think the more people read critically, actually, the better the value becomes. And that you know, entertainment is important, and we should enjoy what we read. I think as often as we can. Um, but you're right. It is it is important to see value in that. Some of the books that really have helped me uh, in my thinking, um, you know, have been uh, some of the books by William Gibson. Uh, he has a, a, a book that came out earlier this year called Agency, which is a sequel that envisions a mix of using quantum tunneling to affect uh, alternative timelines, but is really about kind of the quest and the evolution of power in the West um, that uh, with these sorts of remote systems technologies uh, that you might be able to control again, you know, cross cross timelines, if you can bear with me on that, sure. um, it is, a, is, a fast, is a fascinating kind of riff on, on the way we understand why the world is the way it is, and why it's changing, who has, who has the real power to, to alter it. Um, you know, Gibson, I think, has been consistent in, you know, highlighting really interesting aspects of, of society. Um, in the, the series that, that just culminates in the agency, you know, spoke to me in the prior book also a lot about the way that military uh, veterans will experience life after conflict, particularly with a lot of haptic integration. Uh, I thought that was a really powerful um, book on that. So, you know, I think it, anything by Gibson is always really good to read. I'm reading a book by Olin Steinhauer right now, which is a very hard-boiled spy uh, novel called uh, The Last Tourist, and it's in a series of like four books. Uh, they're the tourist series. They're really good, and, uh, and he's a, a just a, a great writer who's got a lot of experience in Europe and around the world and has done a very nice job. But I think making, making espionage feel like a very realistic activity, not a sensational one. Um, you know, other, you know, great sci-fi, you know, I can, I read a lot um, and I can go back to, you know, books like the, the, the very origin story of like my working with Pete and the things that we, you know, read like Red Storm Rising. And I've been influenced by that for a, by a long time. But at the same time, I was reading a book like that. I was reading books like Hammer Slammers. Uh, you know, which is a kind of futuristic, you know, 20, I don't know, the second or third century story of, of, of armor. So that it's not schlocky sci-fi. Um, and David Drake is, was, a, was a veteran and really, I think, serious about portraying military life. Um, but I, I feel that there's a lot of 80s sci-fi that is worth revisiting, in part because of the context of the Cold War. And a book like Hammer Slammers is, is a great one, too. It doesn't get a lot of, uh, a lot of attention. Um, um, I'm going to go ahead and go to James' question because I, th I think you kind of answered part of what C. Cully was asking about. James said, watching the impact of COVID on the world has exposed the fragile nature of our society. Will our push toward technology-driven capability result in a degree of overconnectedness or interdependency that makes us more vulnerable to black swan events like COVID? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, this is this is very much uh, what's been on on my mind a lot. Uh, you know, some of that is reflected in, in burn in that, you know, the the ability to build, you know, digital connectivity and the ability to manage it at a social level are not the same thing. And, you know, we are at this point where I think and there's an analog to how we do you know, planning and budgeting and concept development for the military that, you know, these technological changes that are underway are not always going to be at the pace of course that we choose whether it's an adversary you know capability like a hypersonic breakthrough or whether it is you know using automation to re, re you know formulate western nations land forces and what are the social and political implications of that um, america does not seem to be getting any less brittle um, you know having a test like this has shown incredible resiliency at a localish state level which is important but some of the contests that we're often thinking about on the national security level are, are ultimately uh, framed today as nation state contests and and what if the response to those in fact is not going to be felt evenly within nations in the future too because of some of these disconnects and fractures that are that are going to be caused by technology that's a pretty profound shift if if true and and something that i think we're not structured to 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 deal with yet uh it may not be able to it might be that that the nations that are able to kind of create not just national will but rather the opposite the ability to have a sort of resiliency that reflects especially in the west uh, an inability to to create that sort of unity in the post-truth era is in fact the one that will prevail in big contests, whether they're kinetic or not, um, because there's no guarantee that that the sort of rivalries that that we can envision in the 21st century will in fact end up like like the sort of shooting wars that that, that we saw in the 20th century. 
Um, it may be that the sorts of permutations of conflict are, are shifting enough uh, that we will have episodes that do look like that, but others, others that are quite different may in fact rest on this, this, this one point I'm, I'm kind of thinking about. Um, we're at two o'clock. I don't want to uh, crowd out the next session, but I really appreciate the chance to talk to everybody. Um, do what you can, take care of yourselves, you know, think, act, create, move, uh, and uh, we'll keep on uh, doing the best we can. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, August, and thank you, everyone, for your great questions. Uh, we'll take five minutes, and we'll be right back.